Hey everybody, Andy here, and I wanted to do something a little different this week. I wanted to talk about my the favorite documentaries that I've seen in 2015. Now that being said, these documentaries may have made be been made before 2015. They're not exclusive to the 2015 year. Also, this isn't your standard top 10 list. These aren't my least favorite to my favorite. These are just documentaries that I enjoyed and that I would suggest other people watch for various reasons. They're just ones I really I really liked, I really enjoyed, and I think other people would enjoy too and get a good amount of information out of them. Because that's what a documentary is, right? It's not only entertainment. You want to be... You want to be entertained and educated at the same time in in whatever area this documentary is telling you about. At least that's how I, I, I view documentaries. Anyways, that being said, let's jump in. These are my favorite documentaries that I saw in 2015. An Honest Liar is the story of magician escape artist the amazing Randy, who was extremely famous in the 60s and 70s, when he decided that he didn't want to be a magician anymore, he uses his talents of deception to become a detective, I guess, to expose charlatans and fakes who would use um, magic and deception to get money from the unwary. There's people such as channelers and faith healers, spoonbenders, and that were very prevalent in the 70s and 80s. He would use his talents to publicly show what these people were doing were, was just magic. It wasn't uh, telekinesis or psychic powers or, or anything. It was just deception. And he publicly exposed people and made fools of them. And pretty much, people didn't like how he went about doing this. But in the end, this is the story of the Amazing Randy, where he started, where he is today. It's a great documentary. Right now on Rotten Tomatoes, An Honest Liar is sitting at 97%. Hitchcock Truffaut is a film about Francois Truffaut and Alfred Hitchcock. They had a conversation in 1962, I believe, uh, for a week, pretty much. I think they pretty much just stayed in a hotel room, or I'm not exactly sure where they were at. But they were had a week, week-long conversation. Uh, at this point, Francois Truffaut was extremely famous, and so was Alfred Hitchcock, obviously, but... Truffaut was much younger, and he was famous and considered a great filmmaker. Hitchcock was kind of known as a guy that makes horror movies, and and he just makes for entertainment and, you know, fun and, and horror. And he wanted to pretty much show the world, Hollywood, that Hitchcock was a genius. And what he was doing and what he has done has influenced many, many people, including himself. This movie has um, lots of guest appearances by David Fincher, Wes Anderson, Martin Scorsese, and lots of other directors and film personalities. And they they talk about what Alfred Hitchcock meant to them. As of today, Hitchcock Truffaut is a 95 on Rotten Tomatoes. Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets is uh, one of those harder documentaries to watch. And what I mean by bad is it's not a terribly done documentary because it's extremely well done. It's hard because of the content. It's, uh, if you don't know the story, there's two cars that pulled up at the gas station around the same time. There was an argument over loud music. And then three and a half minutes later... Ten shots were fired into a car. The car... The person that shot the... Michael Dunn was the person that shot ten, ten bullets into a car full of black teenagers. As a result, 
Jordan Davis was hit three times and pronounced dead at the scene. The story shows the investigation and tr mostly the trial. And it pretty much shows how racial pre prejudice is still rampant in today's world. It, like I said, it's a hard one to watch, but it's it's one of those ones I think everyone should watch. It's It just keeps you aware of what's going on out there, and I highly recommend it. It is sitting at 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Alright, Soaked in Bleach. Now, I know what you're saying, there's... Okay, so like another Kurt Cobain documentary. There's been like 20 of these. Do I really want to watch another one? And I think that might be why this documentary has such a low score. Rotten Tomatoes only has a 30%. And I I just don't think people give this one a chance. This is uh, done differently. It's through the eyes of the private investigator that Courtney Love hired after Kurt Cobain's death. Tom Grant. He was the one talking to Courtney Love, her friends, Courtney Love's attorney, the Seattle Police Department. So he had all these conversations with all these people that that the Seattle Police Department didn't talk to because they pretty much instantly said it was a suicide. They didn't do any murder investigation. They didn't do anything. They cremated his body almost instantly. Courtney Love knocked the, the the shed down or the house the the side house that his body was found in. He pretty much found out that he had so much heroin injected into his body that it would be physically impossible for him to even get up and shoot himself, let alone pull a trigger. They showed that there was a shotgun shell was on the wrong side of his body. If he even if he did shoot himself. And all this stuff that the Seattle the Police Department just totally neglected to do. Oh, on top of it, they never developed the, the crime scene photos. The crime scene photos are still undeveloped in this case. He just showed all the inconsistencies in the Seattle Police Department, all the inconsistencies in Courtney Love and her friend's stories, and it pretty much showed the million reasons why Courtney Love would want to set up a set up a, a suicide for her husband and that there was no reasons why Kurt Cobain would want to kill himself. It's just a different view. If you're a fan of Kurt Cobain, Nirvana, and you're a fan of conspiracy theories, this documentary is for you. Making a Murderer is a Netflix original documentary that was filmed over 10 year period. It started off, um, filmmakers wanted to start a documentary about a man that was wrongfully accused and what they did to help get him out of prison. That Finally, he, DNA evidence proved that he did not rape this woman that he said he never did. For 10 years he said he didn't. 18 years, I mean. Not 10, 18. He had never did it, and finally they they tested this DNA. They they went through all the the DNA testing, and it found out it wasn't him, and it was this other person that the police never investigated. And even though all the evidence was showing that this other guy did it, they decided not to because they wanted to arrest this man, Stephen Avery, because he was kind of a town nuisance. He was kind of he didn't fit in. And you could tell they just kind of wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to put him away. So when they when they built this evidence up that he, and they had enough evidence that he did it, they just arrested him and put him away in prison. Now finally, DNA evidence proves that he didn't do it, so he gets let out of prison. Two years later, he is arrested again for murder this time. He murdered a, they say he murdered a woman and that his nephew helped murder her. This documentary shows um, all the inconsistencies, the terrible 
crazy investigation how they locked down his house for 10 days and didn't let anybody in there while they could do whatever they want without anybody coming in or out. They could have planted evidence, they could have set things up, they could have done whatever. And finally, they didn't find anything, they didn't find anything, and on like the ninth day they find all this evidence. This is beyond fishy, beyond crazy. And on top of that, uh, the, he had blood taken from him from his original crime, and it was put in an evidence locker. And they seal it up, and they put a, um, a safety top on it, I guess. And no one's supposed to open it up, and if they do, they need permission, blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. They go in there, and they find that his blood has been tampered with. Somebody went in there and took blood out of the vial. Didn't tell anybody, didn't sign anything. And conveniently, there's just a little bit of enough blood in, uh, inside her car that they found on his property. Um, he owned a sal salvage yard, by the way, so he owned many, many acres. And beyond all this crazy evidence and all this strange stuff, oh, on top of that, um, the local police weren't supposed to be helping because they knew that they had because of all the the stuff that happened with his previous case and the conspiracy and lack of evidence from the first trial and how they went about um, charging him and everything. So they weren't supposed to be around for this investigation. But yet, during this 10-day period where they were investigating this murder and no one was allowed on the property, there was a bunch of local police that were in his house doing who knows what it's just it shows that how how corrupt some areas can be how corrupt this justice system can be and it's it's just ridiculous it's crazy and this documentary shows all that uh right now there's actually a petition going around to get this looked at again this case and he may have done it i'm not saying he didn't but he needs a proper proper investigation a proper trial the trial he had he was not proven at all beyond a reasonable doubt that he did this there's so much evidence saying that he didn't but again i i just believe he he needs a fair trial so there, I, i'll put a petition the link to the petition if you'd like to sign it in the description below if not that's up to you but it's an excellent documentary it does take some time to watch because it's I think, like I said, I think it's 12 episodes, but I couldn't stop watching it. I watched this over a couple of days, and it was just so intriguing and so mind-boggling and baffling. Um, and it just, it, it, it just boggles my mind how, how something like this can happen in, in today's world. Um, again, this is Making a Murder, Netflix original. And it is sitting at 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Dinosaur 13 is the story of Sue, the famous nearly complete Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, Peter Larson and a uh, team of people from the Institute of Geological Research in the Black Hills uh, found Sue and it's about how what they went through um, purchasing the dinosaur because it wasn't on their land it was on Native American land about digging her up uh, cleaning her up starting to put her together and what happened two years after she was uncovered how the US government came in how they took Sue away and she sat in crates for 10 years while there was crazy court battles. There was huge disputes on who owned her and, and resulting in, in jail time for some of these people because some of the most ridiculous claims in the world. So in, in the end, it is, it is, there is some, some trial in here, a little bit of, you know, jury and all that sort of stuff. But the ultimate story is about Sue, 
the dinosaur and and the people that found her. It's a excellent story if you're really into dinosaurs, if you like paleontology, if you're from the Black Hills, South Dakota, or if you live in Illinois where Sue is now at the Field Museum. It's a pretty interesting story. So I remember when they they announced Sue at the Field Museum. We all went to go see her. Most of us went to go see her anyways. It's about 2000, I believe, 2001. And she's still there today. Pretty interesting story. Right now it is sitting at 71% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, these next two I'm going to um, kind of smush together into one review because they're both similar in the in in the vein that they both are extremely beautiful and they both need to be watched first one here is planet earth done by bbc there's a few of them now but if you want to just watch the original planet earth it's just it's just stunning and it's just it's a beautiful documentary and i think everyone should sit down and watch it the second is cosmos by carl sagan that was back in the I can't, I'm not sure, I think it's be the 70s. And again, that's just extremely informative and, and beautiful. And Carl Sagan just was so passionate about, about the universe. And you just wanted to sit down, I just wanted to sit down and listen what he had to say. And I couldn't wait for the next episode. It's on Netflix, they're both on Netflix right now as far as I know. There was also a remake of The Cosmos by... Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Degra I think it's deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and you know, everyone knows him, he's the astronomer that's always on the TV nowadays when, when you're talking about the universe, and it, it's good, but I prefer the original with Carl Sagan, but if you choose to watch the newer one, that's just fine, they're both extremely informative and extremely interesting, Cosmos and Planet Earth. Maiden Trip is the story of 14-year-old Laura Decker. Well, she's 14 when she starts. I think she's 16 when she finishes. It's a story of her sailing around the world by herself. There's a short scene at the beginning where she has some, a trial or a court hearing about, you know, if it's okay to let her do this. Uh, she's a, a Dutch resident. Uh, she lives in the Netherlands. She was born in New Zealand. But ultimately, let her do it. If you think that the you know this is gonna be a story about her crashing and and being marooned on an island or having like crazy troubles uh, sailing around the world, that's not the story really. It's uh, it's more about her independence and her evolving and growing as a person, her uh, female empowerment and being free and celebrating her youth. It's just a very inspirational story and it's pretty amazing. Right now it's sitting at 82% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's Maiden Trip. Back in Time is a documentary that I thoroughly enjoyed on many levels. Not only because it's probably one of my favorite movies ever made, and Marty McFly is one of my favorite characters ever, probably right behind Indiana Jones. But because it's Back to the Future, oh my God, it's, this movie's such. This documentary just brings brings back nostalgia, and it gives you a whole other level on top of the movies. It it's not your typical uh, making of documentary or where are they now documentary. It, well, it does have those elements, but. The main focus of the movie is the impact that it had on on culture and science and, and everything. Um, it, it, there's hoverboards nowadays, come on. There's people that drive around in DeLoreans that have them souped up like time machines with flux capacitors and, and all the wiring and plutonium and all that crazy stuff. And 
they drive them around for Michael J. Fox's charity or their own charities, or or they just make them for fun because they love the movie. Uh, they have they show people that have festivals, people that get married with Back to the Future themes, uh, people that dress up and the plays that they put on, and and it's it's just crazy the impact that this movie had on on the modern world on and i just loved every minute of it and it just put a whole other layer on top of of back to the future and i want to watch it again and i also rekindled my uh want to own a delorean <laughs> if you love back to the future you'll love this documentary check it out it's back in time here. Thanks for watching my video of my favorite documentaries 2000 I saw in 2015. If you liked it, you know what to do. If not, I will check you guys later.